Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of The Reading Corner with Moose Changer Pat. Well, that's me, in case you're wondering. Today, we are reading Chapter 5 of Magician's Gambit by David Eddings. And as always, you should support the original work by buying the original book. Chapter 5. Garion was not exactly sure when it was that his mind shook off Aunt Paul's compulsion to sink deeper and deeper into protective unawareness. It could not have been long. Falteringly, like someone rising slowly from the depths, he swam back up out of sleep to find himself moving stiffly, even woodenly, toward the horses with the others. When he glanced at them, he saw that their faces were blank, uncomprehending. He seemed to hear Aunt Paul's whispered command to sleep 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 but it somehow lacked the power necessary to compel him to obey there was to his consciousness however a subtle difference although his mind was awake his emotions seemed not to be he found himself looking at things with a calm lucid detachment uncluttered by those feelings which so often churned his thoughts into turmoil he knew that in all probability he should tell aunt paul that he was not asleep but for some obscure reason he chose not to Patiently, he began to sort through the notions and ideas surrounding that decision, trying to isolate the single thought, which he knew must lie behind the choice not to speak. In his search, he touched that quiet corner where the other mind stayed. He could almost sense its sardonic amusement. Well, he said silently to it, I see that you're finally awake, the other mind said to him. No, Garion corrected rather meticulously. Actually, a part of me is asleep, I think. That was the part that kept getting in the way. We can talk now. We have some things to discuss. Who are you? Garion asked absently, following Aunt Paul's instructions to get back on his horse. I don't actually have a name. You're separate from me, though, aren't you? I mean, you're not just another part of me, are you? No, the voice replied. We're quite separate. The horses were moving on a walk now, following Aunt Paul and Mr. Wolf across the meadow. What do you want? Karen asked. I need to make things come out the way they're supposed to. I've been doing that for a very long time now. Karen considered that. Around him, the wailing grew louder, and the chorus of moans and shrieks became more distinct. Filmy, half-formed tatters of shape began to appear, floating across the grass toward the horses. I'm going to go mad, aren't I? He asked somewhat regretfully. I'm not asleep like the others are, and the ghosts will drive me mad, won't they? I doubt it, the voice answered. You'll see some things you'd probably rather not see, but I don't think it'll destroy your mind. You might even learn some things about yourself that'll be useful later on. You're very old, aren't you? Garen asked as the thought occurred to him. That term doesn't have any meaning in my case. Older than my grandfather, Garen persisted. I knew him when he was a child. It might make you feel better to know that he was even more stubborn than you are. It took me a very long time to get him started in the direction he was supposed to go. Did you do it from inside his mind? Naturally. Gary had noted that his horse was walking obliviously through one of the filmy images that was taking shape in front of him. Then he knows you, doesn't he? If you were in his mind, I mean, he didn't know I was there. I've always known you were there. You're different. That's what we need to talk about. Rather suddenly, a woman's head appeared in the air directly in front of Garion's face. The eyes were bulging, and the mouth was agape at a soundless scream. The ragged, hacked-off stump of its neck steamed blood that seemed to dribble off into nowhere. Kish me, it croaked at him. Garion closed his eyes as his face passed through its head. You see, the voice pointed out, conversationally, it's not as bad as you thought it was going to be. In what way am I different, Garen wanted to know. Something needs to be done, and you're the one who's going to do it. All the others have just been in preparation for you. What is it exactly that I have to do? You'll know when the time comes. If you find out too soon, it might frighten you. The voice took on a somewhat wry note. You're difficult enough to manage without additional complications. Why are we talking about it, then? You need to know why you have to do it. That might help you when the time comes. All right, Carrion agreed. A very long time ago, something happened that wasn't supposed to happen. The voice in his mind began. 
The universe came into existence for a reason, and it was moving toward that purpose smoothly. Everything was happening the way it was supposed to happen, but then something went wrong. It wasn't really a big thing, but it just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Or perhaps in the wrong place at the wrong time might be a better way to put it. Anyway, it changed the direction of events. Can you understand that? I think so, Garen replied, frowning with the effort. Is it like when you throw a rock at something, but it bounces off something else instead and goes where you don't want it to go? Like the time Darun threw that rock at the crow and it hit a tree lid and bounced off and broke Falder's window instead. That's exactly it, the voice congratulated him. Up to that point, there had always been only one possibility, the original one. Now there were suddenly two. Let's take it one step further. If Darun, or you, had thrown another rock very quickly and hit the first rock before it got to Falder's window, it's possible that the first rock might have been knocked back to hit the crow instead of the window. Maybe, Garion conceded doubtfully. Darun wasn't really that good at throwing rocks. I'm much better at it than Darun, the voice told him. That's the whole reason I came into existence in the first place. In a very special way, you're the rock that I've thrown. If you hit the other rock just right, you'll turn it and make it go where it was originally intended to go. And if I don't, Falder's window gets broken. The figure of a naked woman with her arms chopped off and a sword thrust through her body was suddenly in front of Garion. She shrieked and moaned at him, and the stumps of her arms spurted blood directly into his face. Garion reached up to wipe off the blood, but his face was dry. Unconcerned, his horse walked through the gibbering ghost. We have to get things back on the right course, the voice went on. This certain thing you have to do is the key to the whole business. For a long time, what was supposed to happen and what was actually happening went off in different directions. Now they're starting to converge again. The point where they meet is the point where you'll have to act. If you succeed, things will be all right again. If you don't, everything will keep going wrong, and the purpose for which the universe came into existence will fail. How long ago was it when this started? Before the world was made, even before the gods. Will I succeed? Garion asked. I don't know, the voice replied. I know what's supposed to happen, not what will. There's something else you need to know, too. When this mistake occurred, it set off two separate lines of possibility, and a line of possibility has a kind of purpose. To have a purpose, there has to be an awareness of that purpose. To put it rather simply, that's what I am, the awareness of the original purpose of the universe. Only now there's another one too, isn't there, Karen suggested. Another awareness, I mean, one connected with the other set of possibilities. You're even brighter than I thought. And wouldn't it want things to keep going wrong? I'm afraid so. Now we come to the important part. The spot in time where all this is going to be decided one way or another is getting very close, and you've got to be ready. Why me? Garin asked, brushing away a disconnected hand that appeared to be trying to clutch at his throat. Can't somebody else do it? No, the voice told him. That's not the way it works. The universe has been waiting for you for more millions of years than you could even imagine. You've been hurtling towards this event ever since before the beginning of time. It's yours alone. You're the only one who can do what needs to be done, and it's the most important thing that'll ever happen, not just in this world, but in all the worlds and all the universe. There are whole races of men on worlds so far away that the light from their suns will never reach this world, and they'll cease to exist if you fail. They'll never know you or thank you, but their entire existence depends on you. The other line of possibility leads to absolute chaos and the ultimate destruction of the universe. But you and I lead to something else. What? If you're successful, you'll live to see it happen. All right, Garen said. What do I have to do now, I mean? You have enormous power. It's been given to you so that you can do what you have to do, but you've got to learn how to use it. Elgarath and Polgara are trying to help you learn, so stop fighting with them about it. You've got to be ready when the time comes, and the time is much closer than you might think. A decapitated figure stood in the trail, holding its head by the hair with its right hand. As Garion approached, the figure raised the head. The twisted mouth shrieked curses at him. After he had ridden through the ghost, Garion tried to speak to the mind within his mind again, but it seemed to be gone for the moment. They rode slowly past the tumbled stones of a ruined farmstead. 
Ghosts clustered thickly on the stones, beckoning and calling seductively. A disproportionate number seemed to be women, Aunt Paul observed calmly to Mr. Wolf. It was a peculiarity of the race, Wolf replied. Eight out of nine births were female. It made certain adjustments necessary in the customary relationships between men and women. I imagine you found that entertaining, she said dryly. The Marags didn't look at things precisely the way other races do. Marriage never gained much status among them. They were quite liberal about certain things. Oh, is that the term for it? Try not to be so narrow-minded, Paul. The society function, that's what counts. There's a bit more to it than that, father, she said. What about their cannibalism? That was a mistake. Somebody misinterpreted a passage in one of their sacred texts, that's all. They did it out of a sense of religious obligation, not out of appetite. On the whole, I rather liked the Marags. They were generous, friendly, and very honest with each other. They enjoyed life. If it hadn't been for the gold here, they'd probably have worked out their little aberration. Garion had forgotten about the gold. As they crossed a small stream, he looked down into the sparkling water and saw the butter-yellow flecks glittering among the pebbles on the bottom. A naked ghost suddenly appeared before him. Don't you think I'm beautiful? She leered. Then she took hold of the sides of the great slash that ran up her abdomen, pulled it open, and spilled out her entrails in a pile on the bank of the stream. Garion gagged and clenched his teeth together. Don't think about the gold, the voice in his mind said sharply. The ghosts come at you through your greed. If you think about gold, you'll go mad. They rode on, and Garion tried to push the thought of gold out of his mind. Mr. Wolf, however, continued to talk about it. That's always been the problem with gold. It seems to attract the worst kind of people, the tall Nadrins in this case. They were trying to stamp out cannibalism, father, Aunt Paul replied. That's a custom most people find repugnant. I wonder how serious they'd have been about it if all that gold hadn't been lying on the bed of every stream in Maragor. Aunt Paul averted her eyes from the ghost of a child impaled on a tall Nadrin spear. And now no one has the gold, she said. Mara saw to that. Yes, Wolf agreed, lifting his face to listen to the dreadful wail that seemed to come from everywhere. He winced at a particularly shrill note in the wailing. I wish he wouldn't scream so loud. They passed the ruins of what appeared to have been a temple. The white stones were tumbled. The grass grew up among them. A broad tree standing nearby was festooned with hanging bodies, twisting and swinging on their ropes. Let us down, the bodies murmured. Let us down. Father, Aunt Paul said sharply, pointing at the meadow beyond the fallen temple. Over there, those people are real. A procession of robed and hooded figures moved slowly through the meadow, chanting in unison to the sound of the mournful tolling bell. Supported on a heavy pole they carried on their shoulders. The monks of Martaren, Wolf said. Tolnadrin's conscience. They aren't anything to worry about. One of the hooded figures looked up and saw them. Go back, he shouted. He broke away from the others and ran toward them, recoiling fr often from things Garion could not see. Go back, he cried. Save yourselves. You approach the very center of the Hora. Mer Amen lies just beyond that hill. Mera himself rages through its haunted streets.